Darling, you have just begun by Dancing Lassie. Chapter 18. Squeak squirms into his arms, and despite everything, Yasker cannot help but laugh as the small dog licks his face a couple of times, pawing at his doublet before dashing away to chase her tail. Yasker scratches behind her ears in the way he knows she loves, and she melts into temporary stillness so as to enjoy his attention properly. But the river god cannot help but wonder what Squeak's presence means. He gets cautiously to his feet, turning to stare up the garden towards his house. Something strange is happening to his vision. The building shimmers in the air. One second here, one second there, one second gone, replaced by a gently swooping glassy hill on which horses are grazing. He frowns at it. The constant shifting is making him nauseous. Squeak butts her head against his shin, and he gracefully tears his eyes away from the hill to look down at her. The little dog pads to the end of the dock and slips into the water, waiting expectantly for him. For the first time ever, Yasker is reluctant to get into his own river. He doesn't know what this place is, but it's not his home. He doesn't know what will happen if he enters the water. Squeak paddles around in a small circle before looking up at him impatiently. Well, he's not going to be able to help Siri from here. He dives into the water and surfaces in time to watch Squeak dissolving into the water, much the same way he does, and he senses her racing away upstream. He follows her, past Fairley, past Laird's Well and the grassy bank where he was tossed carelessly into the river so long ago, up, up, higher into the mountains where an old elven fort lies in ruins near the river's source. Except when he emerges, it's not a ruin that greets him. Elegant elven architecture stands tall and whole in front of him. Intimidating, despite the graceful curls of the design, eerily silent. To his relief, Squeak does not go bounding inside, but instead dashes round the side. Yasker follows, and then, sitting with his back against the wall, looking down at the villages sprawled out below, is a familiar figure. He turns and gives Yasker a toothy grin, one hand automatically reaching down to play with Squeak's ears. It's been many years since I had a dog, Pankratz tells him. Thank you for giving it to me. Yasker approaches cautiously, and Pankratz rises to greet him. They stand face to face for the first time, taking each other in. Not even Squeak dares break the silence. I thought you'd be taller. Pankratz eventually breaks the moment, laughing heartily and engulfing Yasker in a hug. Well met, brother. Yasker has to spit out a mouthful of blonde hair before he can reply. Indeed, we meet at last. His ribs groan in relief when they're released, and Pankratz gestures for him to sit. Where are we? Yasker asks, lowering himself to the ground. Before him, the countryside begins to reconfigure, with villages shifting in and out of focus. Sometimes there are ones he knows, and then they disappear and others appear. Occasionally, they merge together and overlap. Where do you think? Am I dead? No, not yet, little mother. Not for a long time, hopefully. Why would you think that? Well... Yasker brushes some dust from his trousers, trying to sound unaffected. You're here for one. Squeak for another. This is the river, Yasker. It's the one thing we share. It's what connects us. It's who we are. Yasker looks out at the mishmash of villages. They're becoming more solid now, the two styles intermingling. He points. I don't recognize those houses. They're from your memory, aren't they? Long gone now, Bankratz tells him solemnly. Torn down and built on top of. The price of losing. I'm sorry, Yasker says, for lack of anything better. He feels very young sitting next to his brother. Young and inexperienced and so, so lost. Long before you were born, Pankrat shrugs. I used to hate all humans. Even after I died, I still hated them. For centuries after I died, I was filled with a senseless hate. Everything you see before you now burned. This is the last good memory I have of it. Then the tiny human baby was flung into my river. Pankrat looks at him mournfully. You were so small. And so innocent. You opened your mouth to cry and were cut off by the water entering your lungs. And I couldn't hate you. Not this tiny little babe dealt with so cruelly. I let our mother's power back in and you became part of the river. Part of me. There is a lump in Yasker's throat, hot and tight, and he can taste salt as he wills back tears. Thank you. Pankat smiles. The fires went out, and I remember better times, and lo, they appeared before me. He chuckles. Then you went out into the world and started asserting your own perceptions on the landscape. He cuts Yasker over the head, but gently. Your adolescent melodrama certainly lingered. Years of storms and dark gray skies. Thank the gods you eventually snapped out of it. It's not good to hate such an integral part of you. 
Yes, good shrugs. Having Siri with me helped. She made the river feel like home. Good. Everybody stay home. Siri. Yes, good whispers. Something's happened to her. That's why I'm here. I know. Pankrat tells him solemnly. She has accidentally trapped an old friend of mine. She's trapped! Yasker sputters incredulously. That thing is holding a hostage! Peace, brother. Nothing we can fix. The sorceress has forced her way into Siri's mind and left the path behind her. So we can't follow her in! Yasker exclaims. Pankrat snorts. I'd give up our tactical advantage. We can draw them to us. No point in giving up our strongest card. We are most powerful here. Here we shall make our stand. He rises to his feet, offering a hand to Yasker. Be brave and call your daughter to you. I shall not abandon you. I shall stay right by your side. He smiles at Yasker, a proper, warm, reassuring smile. He looks so competent and self-assured, reminding Yasker strongly of Drava, despite the many physical differences between the two, that Yasker can't help but trust him. Toby closes his eyes, seeks out the bond he has with Siri, clear, bright, and solid now that he's near the source of his power, his river, grabs it, and pulls! Gray clouds darken what had been a sunny day. The wind picks up and thunder rumbles in the distance. No rain falls, but its presence looms threateningly on the horizon. A mighty thunderclap echoes around them, and then Siri and Triss are there, the latter lying on the ground, eyes tightly shut, hands clasped firmly over her ears as she shakes her head and writhes blindly in mental anguish. It is not Siri in his daughter's body. Yasker can tell that right away. The way she stands, the way she laughs mockingly at the woman in pain before her, the cruel look in her eyes. She turns towards them with a snarl as she realizes she's been pulled from whatever sick torment she must have conjured for Tress. Yasker wants to run away from it, this corrupted version of Siri, just as much as he wants to run towards it, to shake this thing until it's forced to leave his daughter. Pankret steps forward before Yasker's brain can make up its mind which action to take. Oh, old friend, he sighs sadly. What has happened to you? The thing inside Siri spits at him, eyes nearing in derision. We are not friends, you worthless waste of running Walter. I do not make friends. I am all-encompassing, the end of all things. People fear me. I do not make friends. Bankrat shakes his head, striding across what little ground remains between him and Siri, and enfolds Yasker's daughter in a strong embrace. She struggles, scratching and biting, but he does not let go. He rocks them gently backwards and forwards, pressing his face into her hair. Go through, my friend. You've become trapped in the mind of a little girl who has witnessed horrific atrocities. She has warped you into the worst version of yourself, one that is cruel and all-consuming. I know that is not all there is to you. You are not just the terrifying end. For some, you are a comfort, a much long for companion. You were for me. When I'd been reduced to almost nothing, when every breath was agony, and every part of me screamed in painful release, you were my friend then. Siri stills in his brother's arms. She lets out a shudder. Do you remember now how you were for me? Pankrat's question softly. It was here that you came for me, right by this stretch of river. Do you remember how I welcomed you? A muffled sob comes from the creature. Let the girl go, Pankratz urged. She tripped me! She did not mean to. She was a scared little girl. A powerful one! The creature protests. All right, Pankratz agrees, smiling. A scared, powerful little girl. But you are not in her mind anymore. You are in ours. So let her go, my friend, and greet me properly. Siri's legs give out beneath her and she slumps down, Pankrat's carefully ensuring she makes it safely to the ground. Yasker starts forward, desperate to check on his daughter, but her form shimmers, and suddenly an elegant-looking woman is lying next to her. He stops, staring in amazement. The woman is tall, and apart from blonde hair just a shade or two darker, and eyes of dark gray. She is this spitting image of Mama. She holds up a hand to Pankratz, and he hauls her onto her feet, helping her brush off her simple black dress. Thank you, she smiles at him, and there is warmth and kindness in that smile. For reminding me of who I can be. She grazes his brother's cheek with a kiss, and then she's gone. Nothing can stop Yasker from running to Siri now, but his daughter is calm, sleeping peacefully, and Yasker feels the pull as she instinctively tries to return to her old mind, quiet at last. He let her slip away like water through his fingers, and she fades from view, taking Triss with her.
Yasker lets out a shuddering breath and lies down on the grass, allowing himself to go boneless with relief. Squeak instantly curls up next to him, nudging his head hopefully until he takes the hint and scratches her furry head. It's over? He has the track. Yes. Bankrets laughs. It's over. What happens now? His brother sits down next to him. No, you go back. This place is not for you. You are living still, and I am dead. My time has passed. This is your story now. Of course, if you ever really need me, then I shall be here. Not the mother like the two brother, after all. Yasker feels a watery lump take up residence in his throat. Thank you, he tells his brother. I'm glad I got to meet you. Me too. And don't take this the wrong way, Yasker, but I hope it's a long time before we meet again. A strong hand grabs his shoulder in a brotherly fashion as he sits up and engulfs his previous incarnation in a tight hug. He gives Squeak one last scratch behind the ears, then lets his consciousness drift away into the darkness of a dreamless sleep.